Hi, I'm Danielle Hartman. Welcome to Port and PA, a series sharing the stories of Pennsylvania's craft beer industry. In this episode, we continue catching up virtually to find out how breweries and businesses have adapted during the pandemic. First up, our executive producer, Nate Kresge, talked with breweries offering delivery services. Nate caught up with Free Will Brewing in Percocy, Levante Brewing in Westchester, and Shy Bear Brewing in Lewistown. All right, guys. Well, let's, uh, we can jump into this. Um, <clears throat> so what we're doing, we're doing the did we lose a light? Yes. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it, it's still pretty damn good. It took a shit. All right. <laughs> Fuck. We'll roll with it. So we're doing an episode on, you know, how breweries are dealing with, <clears throat> with things, and you guys uh, started uh, shipping here recently. What was the, uh, the decision-making process to be able to ship statewide? Uh, well, we know that our friends, Levante, have been doing pretty well with the uh, direct ship. And uh, we've always thought about it, talked about it over the years for at least the sour bottles. But, you know, with having our revenue cut in half by what's going on right now, we needed to find an alternative source. Well, at the time of recording this, you guys have just started this, right? Like, this is just a couple days old. Um, yes, okay. <laughs> okay. How's it going so far and where do you see it going? Great launch. I mean, we were super super happy with it. Um, got a lot of engagement on social media. Reached a lot of the, the forums we like to be a part of. Um, so word's getting out there. We haven't really even done any promotion on our end of it just yet. Just kind of relying on word of mouth and seeing what that does. Um, figuring out all the kinks in our process. You know, you can only plan so much. Um, but now when we get a bunch of orders rolling through, it's a lot different than we were just testing it out. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of all hands on deck right now and just going to be learning process for everybody us ups everybody involved yep man there was some you know behind the scenes work that andrew did he had to build a whole new online store you know we were running an online store before this but it didn't integrate with the, the shipping things that we really wanted to have available to us as far as selection so we he built another website behind it so that we could basically take down our other store and put the new one up you know the night before yep so far so good well, are you able to ship outside of the state too, or is it just Pennsylvania? So you need to make sure you're allowed. Um, there are some states that you don't need any agreements with the states, but it is a, a controlled substance. So most states have you know taxes and permits that you need to apply for, and some don't allow it at all. But uh, there's then just eight states you can just ship into. Looking forward, you know, past the the current pandemic situation, do you feel like you're going to continue to do this if it, if all goes well? Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is kind of a, a goal we had for a long time, as John mentioned, particularly for bottles. Um, but, you know, given the, the whole situation, we've got merch, we've got cans, we've got everything available on there. But I think it's definitely got some long-term viability. I think uh, the industry is going to be changed forever after all this. So yep. even when people are coming back and hopefully hanging in our tap rooms again, I think this shipping thing is going to be relevant. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think it's going to be a, a long-term thing for us. Any other issues with setting up shipping or, or just, um, you know, how you guys are getting beer out? Finding the right boxes and the right uh, easy packaging material that is going to not be damaged by a little bit of condensation or anything like that possibility. And you can throw it across the, you know, this floor and kick it around without damaging bottles. One of the things we really wanted to do, which so far is unique, I think, is we didn't want to put any sort of limitations. So... We want to allow people total freedom to order whatever they wanted. We've got orders for like 13 bottles and two four packs, and then somebody can get six four packs and two bottles. Basically, unlimited combinations. Um, so that's proved to be a little tricky. We don't have a set practice for boxes. You can't really have that. So we're trying to figure that out as we go. But like the the freedom to let people choose exactly what they want. Don't have to have any minimum or maximum order quantities. Well, I know I, I'm yeah, testing you out too. I, I ordered a bunch of bottles and, and just a couple of cans, so we're gonna see how that looks when I get. 
now that we're a day and a half into packing boxes, I think uh, I think we should be good. <laughs> we'll see. So I just wanted to check in with you guys because, um, you know, a lot of these breweries are starting to ship and you guys have been doing this for a, a long while now and it kind of rolled right into this time period of, of shipping beer. Can you guys tell me a little bit about how shipping beer came about for you and, and what um, prompted you to do that in the first place? Yeah, so, we, so we've always kind of, uh, our motto is elevate your craft. We're always looking for new ways to uh, not only brew beer and make other products that uh, kind of trumps or exceeds how we did it before, but also new business practices and always looking for, you know, what's next, what's coming down the pike. So very early on in the game, uh, we were a self-distributing brewery and we started partnerships with other distributors in Pennsylvania um, on a secondary distribution right. So by doing that, we had this pretty big opportunity as a company to go direct to every home office in Pennsylvania. And then fast forward to 2020, we didn't really know that we were really going to need this. Yeah. And uh, it actually, you know, became, again, a great opportunity for us to reach people directly when they can't come and see us at the brewery. When you launched that in February of uh, 2019 uh, to now, how have you seen it grow and, uh, and adapt? At first, it was it was kind of like the new it thing, you know, back in February of 2019, uh, we we, got, we saw a lot of sales and then I think it kind of uh, petered off to, it was a convenience factor for some people, you know, maybe they lived too far away, but really wanted to, you know, engage with the brewery and try our products. Yeah, I think that in the beginning, um, it was exciting. Um, and then a month in, um, we announced the free shipping at $75. I think there was a nice little jump at that point. You know, we live in the Amazon age, so free shipping. It's really important to people. Uh, it was always growing a little bit, but this was definitely unprecedented. A whole new, a whole new <laughs> world. And going back to what we did, we decided early on to have the same products online that we did in our tap room. Mm -hmm. So um, that was kind of when the, the whole lime life situation was changing and new releases, new releases of beers were still highly sought after and important and fun for people. But they would, let's say, you know, a batch of beer would, uh, you know, leave the brewery in customers' hands over a week, two week time period instead of one day. Well, that gave people the opportunity to take part in kind of a virtual can release or a mm -hmm. virtual product release. And that always kept uh, Mercury strong for us. That's awesome. Um, let's talk about um, naming the, the service. Uh, how'd you come up with Mercury? Oh, good question. Well, as you may know, Mercury was the, the Roman messenger god. I also recently learned that he was the god of merchants and shopkeepers. So <laughs> it, it makes a lot of sense when you put it all together. You know, if you want to stand for, you know, high quality, but also uh, fast and reliable service, um, we thought that Mercury really fit. Rather than say, you know, this is just Levante, uh, the Juan Levante beer shipping service or can delivery, we wanted to have its own brand. Uh, and its own identity because it is a very different thing from you know the craft beer experience of the mm -hmm. past so and it's kind of like we are all of our local well, we have two locations but they really um have their own names as well i mean the tap room is usually what people call the the uh, main brewery location and then the stables and then there's mercury so it's kind of an extension of our locations as well, each kind of having its unique identity. How has that been going with uh, like a, you know, a big can release uh, virtually? People are in the beginning, especially were worried about well, how long is this going to be open? They don't really know what's going to happen. So they were doing a little bit of that hoarding mentality at first, I think. So um, we just were trying to keep up. We did have a few, uh, releases that sold out that first day. So that was pretty exciting to get that again. And now our curbside pickup that was added on to as, as an extension to Mercury. So now it's, you don't leave your car, you drive in. So there's been a lot of really fun social shares of people in their new line life in the cars as they're inching towards our garage doors where they get it into their truck. So it's been it's been uh, new and exciting and, and just fun for people, I think, too, to still feel like you're connected to a community, um, even though it's mostly virtual. Yeah, I, I think it's been a great experience for customers. Um, I've myself and 
our business partners have ordered as well. Uh, and uh, Amanda and I are drinking all the seltzers and the beer pretty much every day now to deal with the kids. <laughs> so. Yeah, I've ordered a couple of times and it's kind of fun when the box arrives. I kind of forgot what I had ordered at that point. It's like a Christmas opening up the box and, and seeing what all I had uh, thrown in there. You know, whenever a package shows up for you or you get a letter in the mail, it's just this sense of excitement that you get. Yeah, and you're like, oh, even though it was a gift from me a week ago <laughs> you know it's fun it's, yeah. it's a good time so and then you know it's kind of that gift that keeps giving where you get to actually crack that open and mm -hmm. drink it get that second enjoyment yeah, it's exciting when you order it's exciting when it comes and now you still want to be a part of the community so you're sharing it with your friends on social media there's a lot of unboxing videos that are out there um, just cheersing in your stories and things like that and also we're starting to see a lot of people gifting beer um, on front porches too, which has been really cute. So I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you may have had some questions about social media, but that's been a whole new ball game for us as well. Even though we, we really focus on social media and engagement with our supporters and customers and community, it's a, uh, it's at a whole new level now. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, where people used to get together and share a beer now they're doing it over social media and uh, the word travels that much faster of a, you know, exciting new release. That's cool. I've talked to a couple other breweries that have just started doing the delivery service, um, Free Will, and, and everybody talks about you guys as kind of the gold, the gold standard of this, and, and you guys have been very helpful to other breweries, too. Do you see this as any kind of competition, more and more breweries starting to do this? This is a paradigm shift, really. Mm -hmm. It's a change of the whole business, and it, we never saw other craft breweries as competition before, and I don't think in this we see it either. It definitely does put a fire under our butts to start thinking of that new uh, change that's going to come, you know, six months, a year down the road. But mm -hmm. no, I think our, our friends at Free Will just started this and I couldn't be more happy for them yeah. because this gives them so much more opportunity to to grow and, uh, you know, to not only, you know, as fellow brewers stay in business, but also, you know, continue to collaborate, continue to, um, you know, keep that culture that we had before, mm -hmm. just not physically at the tapper. Do you want to Talk me through the process of deciding to do delivery and how that came about. Well, oddly enough, it was something that we were hoping to launch a long time ago. I was actually looking at my receipts of when uh, Levante started their mer Mercury uh, process, and I was looking through all of that, and I can't believe that was February of 2019 that they started that. So I ordered something from them right away to see, okay, what's the scope of this? What do we even do? To even get things rolling in that in that capacity and we saw that it was specific courier and you had to have all of this other background stuff going on and we were thinking well we're obviously not canning on a large capacity right now we really don't have a whole lot of clout we had just started so we thought well we'll just back burner that until we're we have a little bit more uh infrastructure in place and then um obviously Online ordering was something that we were already doing for merchandise and orders to go. So when the whole thing kind of went down, it didn't take us very long to just hop on the concept of just adding our beers, knowing that home delivery was an option just as long as you had uh, processes in place for ID and, and, uh, and flow of it all and making sure that you just don't drop it off on somebody's doorstep and leave. <laughs> So we, it, it didn't take very long for us to kind of really acclimate. It's just the hard part was getting everyone to know about it. And we got three messages today of people who are just finding out that we're doing it. So it's, um, it was definitely a <laughs> baptism by fire, as they say. Well, what were some of the struggles of doing it? What, what, what um, may have made it difficult? Well, I would definitely say the density population of north central Pennsylvania isn't what would be uh, considered very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> so our our concept of where do we get people, in what capacity, uh, what's the right number for minimum delivery order size or dollars or amounts to be able to make it worth it. But we figured our feeling is that, you know, no surcharges, nothing more than just a standard uh, price per four pack as we would normally have somebody who's going to come to the restaurant or come to the brewery and want to be able to have something to go. We wanted the price at the same. So when this ends, 
that there's no real change in that in that structure of uh, revenue or confusion from the end end user. So we thought we might as well just do a thirty five dollar minimum. That basically means two four packs for the most part, and uh, at that point you can um, we can you know deliver basically anywhere within specific map. Uh, coordinates that we created and um, and it's worked out pretty well with the idea we do the center county area twice a week we do the Harrisburg area once a week right now and then the Susquehanna Valley Salem's Grove Lewisburg Mifflinburg area we kind of do that uh, here or there um, but quite honestly the UPS option for now for them being a transporter transporter for hire uh, uh, motion is getting us now positioned to get people in Lancaster, Altoona, Williamsport, places like that. I can I can easily make that happen with with this relationship with UPS. I think the biggest challenge on my end was just um, having to organize what staff we had very quickly to do a different job, um, and and we didn't have a lot of time to, you know, there was no practice runs. It was we. We had the orders and we needed to do it right away. And so they kind of had to take on different roles immediately. And we went from having 10 orders the first day to 30 orders uh, the next week to 50 orders the next week. So we had to do everything very quickly with a limited amount of staff. So that I think that was the biggest challenge with staff-wise anyway. How was your staff adjusting to all the changes and jumping into those roles? Um, they did, they did very well for as quickly as we had to do it, I think. Um, and not having, not because we never did it before, we didn't really have the proper, um, I guess mechanics to do it or, you know, we had to hand can a lot. So Mm -hmm. it was a lot of work at, at first just to figure out how to organize it. So, um, I think we had some days that were a little more stressful than others. And then as they became more comfortable, um, it was, it became more routine and almost robotic. And then we, then we were okay. Robotic is definitely the word for it. Yeah. (laughs) You know, you just see the tickets come in and normally it's a flight of this or a pint of that. And now you're just seeing four pack of four back of four pack. And then it's just, she lines up all of the orders for everybody for the entire route. And we kind of do it like a pick ticket. So we'll run all 24 packs of this particular beer at one time. And then she always um, would do the, um, our bartender would always do the uh, Tico Suave, the um, the coffee stout at the very end because it was the stickiest. So it was, <laughs> it was at the very end of the day. Those were things we learned. Do not do the sticky beers first. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, but it, it takes about eight hours um, to get an order ready for the next day with uh, organizing and hand canning. And so it, it, it is a long day. Well, I know I, I had ordered personally and had you guys show up and it's pretty cool seeing your van pull up in front of your house and uh, the Shy Bear logo there. And it's like, oh, you know, the, the beer has arrived. Um, we have a photo and I'm just going to say this in case we use the photo. This photo was taken before masks were kind of recommended and uh, things were are, are constantly changing here. But how, how are how is it received when you pull up with the van and, and people come to the door? What, what kind of reaction do you get? It is like it, like we're an ice cream truck for grown ups. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, especially you can just tell uh, the certain parents that have been waiting for said delivery all day long. The kids are driving them nuts. They're, they've been on 18 Zoom calls with their coworkers and they're like frothing at the mouth <laughs> when you come out with cold beer. It's incredibly satisfying and gratifying to um, to talk to customers of course, from a safe distance, um, and be able to um, understand where they're coming from. Have a little talk. You know, it's we're trying to, I guess, try to personalize the the thing. Just like as if they would come to the brewery, how can we somehow still be that? And that's why we wanted us to be the delivery people and not um, somebody else on our staff. Just to personalize the fact that hey, the owners are are driving around in in this fancy uh, van. <laughs> Um, showing up, talking to people, how are you doing? How's everything? Please, you know, when all this unfolds, um, we'd love to have you come and 
and enjoy everything when uh, when we can host you again. So that part is nice. Um, I, I, I would be lying if I said that the some of the hours and and road <laughs> wariness isn't somehow doesn't affect you, especially at the end of the day and pouring rain. It's like, uh, do I have to get out of the car again? Um, but it's at hey, w- this is adaptation at its finest at this point, and that's. That's how we look at it. Yeah, it's satisfying when, uh, you know, if you've had a long day and then you go to the last house and that person comes to the door wearing shy bear swag and you can see them like jumping up and down through the uh, glass yes. <laughs> door. <laughs> and we've seen a lot of Instagram posts of our van. I, It's almost like it's its own. I should probably create a, a profile. <laughs> Have its own van, Instagram so. account. Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And the van's definitely recognizable because if we go to a neighborhood and we've had one delivery there, the next week we'll have about three or four deliveries in that neighborhood. Just, I think, for people seeing it, yeah. That's cool. How how have you seen it grown from day one? I would say over half are people who are having our beer for the first time that have never even been to our place. So this is – we're reaching out to a new demographic and a new uh, group that I think take beer and their – their appreciation for it more seriously now than the proliferation of craft beer boom. Because I think people are, are truly seeing uh, kind of like grassroots. These are the things that we don't want to go away when this all clears up. We want to be able to be, um, we want these people that are making a difference in their industries to do that. And honestly, we we hope that we can be doing the same thing for other people, you know, in, in, in our own buying patterns. I mean, I'm finding myself not ordering nearly as much from Amazon as I once did. Like I'm, I'm, I'm physically taking those times to say, why would I do that if I could get it from somebody who really needs the help right now? And it's building excitement meant for them to come see us yeah. because they had never been here before and now they're excited for when we do open to come see us and you know you can't go to amazon but you can come to shy bear real quick too you guys are doing some really cool things with your ordering um you're allowing people to uh, donate and, and do different uh uh opportunities to give back can you talk about that a little bit yeah our pine it forward program was intended to be first responders or healthcare professionals who are directly on the front lines of this pandemic and our goal was to see however many people wanted to donate to that cause we're turning around uh, and it's on the same form as somebody can donate to it they can also sign up for it so if they are somebody who is uh, one of those healthcare uh, workers or EMTs or anybody who is directly involved in this, um, we want to, uh, when, when we open back up, we want to basically, uh, buy them a beer. So whether or not we get the donations for it, um, that's great. And then all we're doing is turning around, sending them a $6 coupon for a beer when they, um, when they come here, um, this summer, hopefully. And, um, yeah. And in whatever, Whatever we don't get in, in donations, we're basically just covering it ourselves just as a thank you for for everything that they're doing. Because it's one thing for us to do it, but we're, we, we drop off beer and put it on somebody's front step and basically say, thank you. How are you guys doing? OK. And then we walk away um, to see what nurses and doctors and everybody is facing right now. And in the long days of not being able to leave, you don't can't leave that doorstep. Um, it's, it's, it's incredible and it's, it's humbling really. It's not just breweries who changed their business model during the pandemic. Our producer, Sarah Bozich talks with Deer Creek Malthouse and Glenn Mills, a craft grain supplier about an entire new line of products with purpose. The first thing we really want to talk about is how you guys have really pivoted your business during this pandemic to help your neighbors. Can you tell me about that whole project? pivoted a, a lot about our business in the past uh, month or so. Um, we were uh, affected because a lot of our customers uh, were affected. The closure of all restaurants, bars, breweries, distilleries meant that demand uh, for our ingredients, for them to produce food and beverages really kind of uh, fell off a cliff. We started talking to other grain folks around the country. The folks in the upper Midwest at the Artisan Grain Collaborative were, were, were doing was this uh, neighbor loaves project. Um, where bakeries 
um, kind of banded together and uh, created an item in their online shops um, to sell loaves of bread uh, direct to consumer, um, just like they would any of their other loaves, except in exchange um, for that purchase. Uh, the loaf didn't go to the person who purchased it. It actually was uh, donated to uh, local food banks and uh, thought it was a really elegant solution to a lot of the challenges um, that bakeries in this situation were facing. But we kind of twisted uh, or tweaked the program a little bit and uh, applied it to ingredients in the, in the middle of the value chain. So as we were pivoting our business to sell ingredients direct to consumer, um, both raw grain, flour, uh, malt, as well as some new baking mixes and things that people could uh, uh, bake with at home, we applied the same concept and created uh, some neighbor loaf equivalents of flour and or malt um, that we're donating to local bakeries to bake these loaves for uh, people in need. And a lot of the distillers in Pennsylvania have kind of banded together as well um, to help produce some high uh, proof alcohol uh, and formulate into a hand sanitizer. And uh, we thought that was another way that we could contribute um, with donations from consumers. So we're doing the same thing with malt and selling one and a half pound retail bags of malt. Um, to consumers and then donating that malt to distillers to make a, a sanitizer. So it allows us to keep selling, keep buying ingredients from farmers too. So it really, you know, we're using local ingredients, buying from local farms. So the more we, uh, we sell, we're pulling that through all the way to the farm and uh, uh, trying to help some people in need while we're <laughs> figuring out how to uh, uh, survive in this uh, environment right now. <laughs> um, so what's the response been like? It's been really, really great. Um, we're, we're a wholesale business and have supplied you know, commercial brewers, distillers, bakers for you know, five or so years now and don't have a, a big consumer presence and have, have gone to some farmer's markets and um, there's been, I guess, some increasing brand awareness of what it is we do to consumers, but we don't know, we don't engage with a lot of consumers, so we weren't really sure how much people were going to be shopping in our online shop and buying the loaves and, and, and sanitizer uh, equivalents of grain and flour and, and malt. But uh, people have been buying them um, from, you know, someone adding one item to their cart in addition to the pancake mix and the granola and the, uh, the pizza mix that they're already buying uh, to someone who just goes in the shop and buys like 20 of them and, and gives like a generous, um, you know, hundred or $200 donation. So um, it's been really, really cool to see. In two weeks, we've sold about 500 uh, loaf equivalents of flour, um, and the same with sanitizer, um, about 500 four-ounce uh, sanitizer equivalents of malt. So um, not a, a putting a huge dent in the hunger problem or uh, the, uh, the sanitizer effort, but I feel like as more and more people um, add these items to their shop and uh, sell the loaves. Um, especially, I think we're going to be able to, to to make an impact. And there's a couple food banks that are kind of excited about what we're doing too. So, are there have there been any favorites in terms of the consumer products, like the homebrew kits and bread mixes? Yeah, um, we've it's like we've converted the malt house into like the Keebler Elf workshop, <laughs> uh, cranking out you know hundreds of bags of. Uh, of flour uh, and, and mixes and things like that. But uh, the granola has been very popular, um, especially for people who don't want to do anything additional at home. You know, it's ready-made, um, it's all local, organic ingredients, rolled oats from a farmer um, in New Jersey, um, organics, um, as well as a couple other uh, farms that we're sharing. And that's kind of the fun of this too. Like we've been able to keep supporting a variety of local farms by um, buying either flour or oats or um, a whole grain from different people to make these mixes. But yeah, the granola has been popular. Uh, the pancake mix as well, because those were kind of the two first uh, products that we had produced uh, before things got a little turned upside down recently. But um, uh, pizza mix and the artisan uh, or heritage bread mix that we just uh, released last week have been really popular. And uh, uh, we have had a lot of inquiries from people um, that were doing sourdough at home, you know, recommended recipes. And we started to put together some homebrew kits as well, um, which uh, we've always been a little reluctant to do and just relied on, you know, uh, the homebrew stores um, to kind of help 
uh, package our products uh, to consumers. But um, just wanted to remind people, you know, even though we're going crazy with these baking mixes, you know, we do sell ingredients for brewing. That's how we got started. And <laughs> you can use the same ingredients that the pros are using at home and uh, kind of prepackage two different recipes that um, uh, we like and are pretty versatile so people can still uh, improvise a little bit at home. Um, can anyone order? Are you shipping throughout the state, um, beyond? Uh, how can people find what you have to offer? Uh, everything's available in our online shop. We will uh, do home delivery to anyone. Um, we have local pickup at the Malt House uh, for people who are nearby in Glen Mills, as well as a couple locations in the greater Philly area. Uh, most of the farmer's markets have changed over to pre-order pickup um, just to keep it a more safe environment for people, both the vendors as well as consumers shopping in the market. Um, but yeah, we'll ship anywhere. Uh, I guess the only exception is the, uh, the alcohol. Um, we're not a brewery, but we do, we do have a, a brewing license and have been you know, making some experimental beverages as well. In addition to the foods to showcase our ingredients. And, um, that's something we're not shipping out of state, but we can ship in state. I was going to ask if you were brewing even at home. Um, cause I know that you like to brew, um, uh, anything you're whipping up. The thing that we've been tinkering with the most is, uh, some malt sodas and seltzers and teas, uh, trying to come up with some non-alcoholic recipes um, that showcase some of the flavors that malt can contribute um, without actually fermenting it into alcohol, um, which has been fun and a little harder than we thought. I mean, you, you really do get a lot of flavor uh, from just a little bit of, of some of our malt ingredients in uh, and in a beverage where there isn't carbonation or there isn't a whole lot of alcohol or hops. Um, it's been kind of fun trying to play with that balance to figure out what the right flavor profile is for people. But uh, that's probably the thing we've been playing with the most. And hopefully we'll be able to commercialize some of those and share them with people uh, in the future. Next, we talk with Bill Kovaleski at Victory Beer about how his team has adapted to get more beer into the community during this time. I actually have three crawlers downstairs that a friend got from Parkersburg. So I'd love to hear how you guys have, um, you know, what your thought process was in adapting and reacting. Well, I'm really pleased with the way our team has uh, sort of embraced the challenges of this pandemic and uh, continued to try and serve the public that uh, has tremendous love for Victory Beer. And um, we've done the takeout food. And as you alluded to, this uh, three for ten dollar crowler situation was really our opportunity to continue to surprise and delight the audience that's been so loyal to us. We wanted to do something that would be fun to build. You get three of them. So you get to really sort of have the same taproom experience you might have had by experimenting with three different flavors, but in the comfort of your home and hopefully with someone else to help you enjoy all that beer. And the other thing, too, I think that's important about the Crowler program is that it's a responsible way to deal with a whole heck of a lot of kegged beer that otherwise may not find a home. You know, we're proud of our team members. We're proud of our audience. We're proud of our beers. Having them locked up in a keg not to be enjoyed, that would be a tragedy. So are you guys still producing regularly? Certainly not to your typical volume, I would imagine. Surprisingly, uh, our production is off very little. The packaged beer is doing phenomenally well through all of those channels. Um, so we've definitely had to uh, modify operations here, also in terms of our hygiene sanitation regimes as well. So we're working different shift structures, but we're working, we're outputting as much beer almost as we had anticipated on schedule this year. And I understand you guys are doing some programs to give back right now too. Can you tell me about those? Yeah, very proud of some of the opportunities. Uh, I think the highest profile one would be working with Southern Tier Distillery in order to get their hand sanitizer here into our tap rooms for sale. And all the proceeds from those sales we are giving to the Chester County Food Bank. They're a partner that we're very familiar with. We've worked with for years. And I guess the way we looked at this was, you know, sanitizer is now a necessity and food is a necessity and not everyone has access to as much as they need. And uh, for our community around here in Chester County, we wanted to sort of highlight that and make sure that need was being considered. Is there anything that you want to talk about that I didn't ask you about yet? You know, in terms of the charitable aspect of this, one of our brewers came up with a great idea. His wife works at uh, Pennsylvania Presbyterian Hospital. And um, 
All of our staff gets um, a certain allotment of beer uh, per month. And uh, he brought up the idea like, hey guys, if you'd like to donate this month's beer, I'll be driving it down you know, to the first line responders at the hospital. And he got a tremendous response. So we've done two drops, 20 cases the first time, 17 cases the second time. And um, it's really fulfilling to see how uh, grateful these folks are because, you know, their days are harrowing. And uh, a great fresh victory beer at the end of it, everybody's happy. That's really wonderful. And what a great staff you have to have taken the initiative to do that on their own too. That's really cool. Um, yeah, that's why I say I'm so proud of some of the pivots and the opportunities that, that people have recognized. There's a lot, of, a lot of heroes throughout industries who have seen opportunity in this crisis. Thanks for joining us. We have just one more for you, a brewery spotlight on Wall and Paul Pack in the Poconos. They had some very cool ways for their customers to survive the quarantine. Until next time, cheers. So we're obviously in really strange times right now and it's been really, um, it's honestly exciting and kind of rejuvenating to see so many breweries be able to pivot and, and offer services right now. So can you tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing at Wall and Paul Pack? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this is nothing like anything any of us planned for, anything we've seen before. So um, right away when things were starting to get different, we realized we needed to find a way to keep up with volume, keep getting our beer out in the market, stay relevant with our customers, um, you know, who we may not see for who knows how long. So one of the things that we came up with was we quickly realized we had a, a good variety of beer in cans and bottles. So we came up with this 14-day quarantine pack. So I, I kind of tossed it out there and my staff's all like looking at me like, yeah, we'll see. And I was like, well, 14 days, right? Like everyone's just got to lock down. We'll be fine. 14 days, you know, maybe, maybe we'll go through it twice. This will all be over, right? Who knew? Um, here we are now. But um, yeah, we, we did the quarantine pack. So um, we basically had 15 beers in there because we wanted a celebratory beer for day 15 to say like, hey, we made it through quarantine. You know, everything's good. So we, we put this variety pack together and um, just to kind of show support for some local uh, producers in the area, we put like some other little items in there. So we had a coffee sample from a local roastery. Um, we had a dip mix so you can make like a little, you know, happy hour snack at home um, from a local spice company. So we, we've done some really cool little like bonus kind of treats in the boxes that we've put out and they, they've been a huge success. Uh, we also tacked a charity to our quarantine packs. So the first uh, two that we did, we supported the Cooperage Project, which is a local charity in Honesdale because they're doing huge, huge things to support the community with the food bank, um, feeding lots of kids, lots of families in the area. And then for the most recent two, we switched it to the um, local high school. So they have a food pantry there. And same deal, they've been really struggling to feed a lot of the families in the community that are in need. So $5 from every pack we've sold has gone to these charities. Um, we've raised over $2,000 just on quarantine packs, helping support them. So it, it's been a pretty big deal for us. That's awesome. Um, I'm sure it's been a really great way to connect with your customer base. Do you um, envision yourself continuing to do something like this even after quarantine is lifted? Yeah, we, I mean, this was like a good experiment for us into like variety packs and um, kind of seeing what people wanted. And just from a, you know, a sales perspective, we'll definitely continue to do these in the future. Um, maybe they won't be quarantine packs. Hopefully we won't have quarantine in our situation forever, but um, definitely offering a variety pack, um, you know, it's, it's been eye-opening for us. We're only two years old, so we haven't been at this very long, but we opened really large. We have a 20-barrel brew house. Uh, we have over 300-barrel uh, cellar capacity, so we're sort of an oddity. I wasn't a home brewer coming into this. I'm a CPA, so I have a business background um, and just wanted my own business and wanted something fun, and, and beer was it for me. So um, since we've opened, we've actually doubled the capacity of our brew pub. I'm actually sitting in the addition that we just opened last summer, and we're, we were hoping to have a great summer in here. Um, we also have our beer garden, which we opened. So hopefully eventually once we get seating going again, we'll be able to you know, have some people in here at least and, and out in the beer garden, which will be great. You know, we're just looking forward to getting back at it once all this is done and kind of picking up where we left off and, and hopefully be around for a while. So, um, and so what are you drinking? One of your own, obviously. What do you have there? So I, this is kind of my go-to for a long day or uh, just a nice day like today. It's our Pawpaw Cream Ale. So it's super easy drinking, super light, low ABV, because still have to do some work today. But um, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is like my favorite refresher beer. It's, it's really, really, really delicious. Nice and easy drinking. 
Awesome. Is there any um, style of brewing that you specialize in? Um, so we actually do some really great lagers. Uh, we kind of, you know, early on decided like we didn't want to be just a, you know, one style brewery. I've always enjoyed going to a brewery, getting a flight of beers and having variety in my flight. You know, don't give me four double IPAs, like give me a lager, give me the double IPA, but give me a sour and something else with it. So, you know, we've done a really good job of having like a seasonal lager, a seasonal IPA. One of our flagships is a Hefeweizen. So that's interesting, especially being up where we are. Uh, so yeah, we've, we've, kind of uh, been able to keep a really nice selection of beer. We always have at least like 15 different styles on draft. So it's definitely been a, a challenge to keep up with that. But people really, really like our lagers. And then our, our double IPA series, Lake Hayes, that we do is always a quick seller too. I'm just curious. So are you from Wall and Paw Pack or from the Poconos area? Um, so I'm from right over the border. So we are extremely close to New York. Uh, we're about 20 miles away. So I live over in Sullivan County, New York. So my commute is about 25 minutes every day. We always came up here as kids, like we had a boat and this was kind of just the place to be. We'd come over for the day, go back home. And uh, just as I've grown up, I just, I really fell in love with this area and um, it's just very business friendly. The community's super supportive of everything we do, which is awesome to have that kind of, uh, you know, support in, in your town. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, I like Pennsylvania. It's just really nice over here. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, do you guys offer food too? We do, yep. Yeah, we do like upscale pub food. You know, we've got like our chefs do a lot of scratch from our kitchen. Um, we're, we're very minimal frozen products. We get a lot of fresh food in and just try to keep it interesting. We don't have a huge menu, but like what we have is, you know, something all of our chefs take pride in and it's uh, it, everything that pairs with beer. You know, we, we try to stick to, to good traditional pub food, but like kick it up a notch. So it's, it's pretty good. Well, that's awesome. Well, I can't wait to visit once all of this is over. And people can be together enjoying beers again. So thank you very much for this. Yeah, nice to meet you. Cheers. Yeah. yeah, cheers. 